This evening we have two very special speakers. Our second speaker of the evening is, is uh, Karthik Lalitraj. He has over 18 years of experience and is the principal solutions architect for Kinetica. Now prior to him we have speaker number one. Um, she is the leading, she leads IBM Watson's, I gotta read this, Accelerated Cognitive Systems Research as the Research Memory Strategist. That's a really long title. Please welcome Hillary Hunter. Thanks for the kind introduction, and I appreciate the energy here. I've never gotten up to have a technical conversation after fun trivia, so this is great. <laughs> Loving the meetup already. Um, so I work at the IBM TJ Watson Research Center. It's about an hour from here. Um, and at the TJ Watson Research Center, we have everyone from the mad scientists doing quantum computing at temperatures literally colder than outer space, um, to people doing carbon nanotubes, uh, chip design, system designs, databases, programming models, cloud delivered services. We have this huge span and spectrum. I'm somebody who sits right in the middle um, from the between the transistors and, and the cloud. Um, and my background is in electrical engineering and in systems design. So before we get into Kinetica and their technology tonight, I thought I would just quickly explain what accelerated uh, cognitive infrastructure, which is the new shorter name for my department is. Um, and why, as a person who does systems and hardware, I'm here opening up the discussion today. So the reason for why uh, systems is relevant to um, a NoSQL, MySQL meetup and relevant to the database discussion we're going to have here in a minute is that there's been this fundamental thing happening in the silicon technology industry, and there's been a trend that we're noticing in response to that. So the fundamental thing that's happening is that Moore's Law, which was this statement that processors and systems and computers generally would get faster and faster and double in speed at a certain frequency. Um, regardless of whether or not you want to argue about whether or not it's ended, um, the economics of it have definitely gotten to be much more challenging. And so um, when we look at processor performance delivered purely by uh, technology scaling, we see it starting to level off. And that's shown um, in this graph here on the left-hand side, um, that over time, um, the, the value of sheer t uh, technology scaling uh, has started to diminish, uh, diminish somewhat. What we see, though, is an opportunity to invest in things like interfaces, to invest in memory technologies, and to invest in customization of the computing to match it to workload performance to continue to deliver effective computing um, that continues along a line similar to the historical Moore's Law scaling curve. At the same time that this is happening, there's also the explosion of data, which is really the world that I think most of you live in, um, which is that you know we used to have a certain amount of structured data accumulating over time. That's the sort of uh, lighter green there toward the bottom of the chart as we move um, from left to right forward in time. But the big data era is really characterized by this explosion in data, as well as a shift to increasing amounts of unstructured data. Um, and the response in the open source uh, community has been around different databases, different um, analytic capabilities, analytic capabilities combined with data set, uh, database uh, capabilities, et cetera, in order to address how do I get insight and such out of this data, how do I handle unstructured data and data sets and such like that. So um, as we look at these uh, two trends, um, we've taken some steps forward to try to address them. Um, from our perspective, there's a lot of different things going on in a lot of different spaces. There's a lot going on in open source. Um, and so we're really focused on collaborative innovation. And so I think the, it took a while for the audience to get to, you know, the Open Power Foundation has 300 people, 300 different institutions in it. Um, I'll explain just briefly what that is and, and, and why we're here with Connecticut today. Um, but we really think that there's um, a lot of opportunity um, to partner with different companies doing different types of software and also different types of hardware as we go into this era um, of heterogeneity in systems and uh, big data and analytics on that data. Um, secondly, um, open composable systems refers to the opportunity to introduce customized processing into system design. And so what you're going to hear about tonight um, is leveraging GPU technology from NVIDIA um, with those thousands of effective processing cores and threads um, in order to do smaller mathematical operations of analytics more effectively and, and at higher throughput than with a traditional processor. But 
the composability refers to uh, being able to use different types of accelerator technology that are matched to the workload characteristics that you're trying to accomplish. And lastly, uh, integrated hardware and software. Um, everything that my team does and, and a lot of what we're doing in the open power ecosystem um, is explicitly co-designed hardware and software um, so that we can get to better performance by being aware of the infrastructure that our databases and our analytics run on. And so this really has to do with um, getting the best possible performance out of the infrastructure um, that's available to you and ultimately then you know, delivering greater value at the solution level. So um, just to speak to the Open Power Foundation for just a minute here, um, the reason that we brought it up is because Connecticut um, has been a partner since the early days of Open Power. Um, but there's now 300 members um, spanning from chip designs um, and accelerator designs, um, I.O., uh, storage, uh, system integration, software, and you can see spanning all the way up into um, uh, Canonical, um, others up in the Linux space, and HPC, et cetera. So this is a broad ecosystem, and the types of things that we're uh, doing in this uh, type of environment and that we're able to do now in system design are what's shown here and what will be featured in terms of performance and some of the things that Karthik talks about. So the picture here um, on the left-hand side um, is a system that you could do uh, with a CPU today uh, with a PCIe link, which is a fairly narrow bandwidth link connecting you to the GPU to do your analytics, to do your machine learning, to do your uh, deep learning type function. Um, what we've built within the open power ecosystem is on the right hand side, and this is what we call the Minsky server. It's based on IBM's Power 8 processor, but as you'll see depicted by the fatter lines connecting the CPU to the GPUs, um, there's two and a half times the bandwidth, there's um, bidirectional 40 gigabyte per second links between the CPU and the GPU. What this means is that you can uh, get to the GPU uh, computation quicker, you can get to the data in the CPU host memory quicker, and this can enable you to do things like in-memory database um, and integrate that with GPU function, which is what you're going to hear about here um, in just a minute. It can enable you to do analytics on uh, larger models, uh, leveraging uh, up to you know terabytes of data uh, that are resident in the CPU memory. So this type of system balance and integration, um, we believe, is um, really going to help push things forward in the machine learning and deep learning uh, and generally also you know moving into AI as we see that integration of these large volumes of data with the processing capabilities of things like GPUs. So with that um, I will hand it over to Karthik who's going to talk to you about uh, GPU data is function available from Kinetic. Thank Hi everyone, Karthik here. Um, so hopefully you can hear me. Okay, so how many of you have um, heard about GPUs prior to the trivia? Oh, no. How many of you are using it in production today? Excellent. That's very good. Okay, so um, we'll quickly talk about, uh, for the rest, we'll quickly talk about the evolution of GPUs. I won't spend too much time on it, but we'll uh, interpolate with a few demos, so we'll keep it interactive, uh, and we'll keep it. We'll try and keep it uh, conversational as well. Okay, so the evolution of GPUs. Um, so one of the things that um, we did back in 2009 was um, our CTO Nima and um, and Amit Vij. So they were working for the National Security Agency. Um, they were asked by the U.S. military to come up by General Keith Alexander at that time to come up with a database for terrorist threat, for detecting terrorist threat from multiple sources. Right? So they essentially had 200 different sources, they had petabytes of data, they had multiple feeds, and they had to um, look at those feeds, perform some analytics on it. They had a number of different systems. Money wasn't the matter here, right? So they had a number of huge systems, and they wanted to slice and dice the data to detect terrorist threats in real time. 
Now, the challenge was uh, they had nothing in the market at that time that could do it. So General Keith Alexander invested some money, and our CTO, Nima, at that time came up with a uh, came up with a design that utilizes GPUs for analytics. So that's where we started out, right? So one of the trivia questions was when was it started out? It was back in 2009 by our CTO, uh, Nima. What happened since then was um, Nima implemented this in the US Army, and in 2012, he requested that they take this project and introduce it to the outside world. So that's when GPU DB started. Um, they renamed it to Kinetica. Um, last year, we, re we renamed the product to Kinetica. Um, this slide talks a lot about the advances in data processing from, for the last, I would say, 20 years, from the time I started my, my career. So when I started out back in the 90s, uh, 1990s, uh, we, all, we obviously had the concept of data warehouses. Um, we moved to a distributed storage mechanism. In 2005, I actually built my own data grid. Um, my primary job was with uh, building an insurance application, but we ended up building a data grid, and everyone wanted to use it. So since then, we've had a lot of um, open source data grids. We have in-memory databases. We have NoSQL. Um, what we've seen is at some point of time, well, we, we obviously have Hadoop code, right? Hadoop, um, we have uh, HANA, MemSQL, Exadata for faster analytics. But what we've seen is it's not, it's not only sufficient to offload data. It's, it's, it, there's a need to offload the compute itself, right? So what we do right now is not only offload the data, and we'll talk about a little bit about how we offload the compute in the GPUs. Right? Okay, so um, a GPU itself, I know we uh, spoke about this again a little bit in the trivia. So on average, GPUs have two big advantages over CPUs. Right? The first big advantage is it has anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 cores. Right? An average CPU, an average box, I've seen boxes from anywhere from 8 cores, 16 cores, I've seen boxes with uh, some banks across the river with 80 cores, right? 80 cores, 126, 128 cores. But an average um, of this is a K80 GPU has anywhere from 3,000 to 5,000 cores. We have the new Pascal uh, series, the P100s. So those are double procession with 5,000 cores on one single GPU chip. Or on a machine, on a box, you can fit anywhere from two, on, on those power rate boxes, you can fit anywhere from two to eight <coughs> Um, eight GPUs. So imagine the number of cores. Imagine the number of uh, imagine the power of, of one of one machine that's uh, horsepowered by the GPUs. That's one that's one advantage. The second advantage is parallel processing, right? So the concept is single instruction, multiple processing. So your instruction set would be broken down into a number of pieces, and now it would be given to the GPUs for parallel processing, right? So that would be really very um, very very fast. So with that said. Um, before going into more slides, let's go to a demo. Right? Let's see what, what this does for you. Okay, so I have with me a cluster uh, which is backed up by uh, three of the um, Minsky boxes um, that Hillary was talking about. Um, we have uh, the K80s here. We don't have the P100s with the NVLink. So this is three to five times slower. So the performance that you see, uh, you can do the math. So if I if I give you, let's say, a 500 millisecond performance, you'll have to do the math to find out the performance with the, with, with the NVLink, right? Um, so this cluster has around two terabytes of data. Um, so if you look at the data, the way it's stored in Kinetica, it looks like any other table, right? So this has around, um, this, this there's one collection which has around 20 billion. So I don't know if you can see from there, that's. 21 billion actually, 21 billion entries. But if you do a count of everything, it's probably close to around 30 billion, right? So that's the normal size um, of a cluster. So what we will be interested in is this table here, the Twitter table here, right? So that has four billion plus entries. Now imagine if you have to do calculations on a table which has four billion entries. Let's say if you want to do aggregate calculations, group by calculations, if you want to do uh, sum, min, max, standard deviation, you know, things like that, joins, right? Distributed joins, broadcaster joins. How long would it take, right? The previous company I was working for, if I had, the product that I was working for, if I actually did this, product would crash, right? So, um, anyway, so let's let's try to do some analytics on this on this data, right? So what we have here is a dashboard. It's called a reveal dashboard that um, plots all of these points in real time. So for the dashboard to come up with four billion points, it takes a few milliseconds. Right, so 
It takes more seconds to actually paint the dashboard in the UI than for you to go and get the data. OK, so if I hit the live update button, you can actually see live tweets coming through. There's small sparkles there. Right? So you can see the count increasing. So there's around 4 billion plus entries. So let's do a little bit of quick analytics on it. OK, so um, let's see. So we'll first. OK, there you go. So we'll first, uh, so our background was geospatial, right? So the um, US military wanted um, uh, a lot of geospatial uh, analytics. So we built, uh, we built a number of functions that enable WKT um, and WMS, right? So what I would like to do is to draw, let's say, a freehand, a freehand polygon around, let's say, the New York region, right? So let's say I, I, I want to be able to filter this region. So what this would do is filter all the tweets which are there in this region, and it gives me the results. So now I was able to filter from 4 billion to 131 million in a few milliseconds. Right? And the reason why we were able to do this was because in the, so fast is because we were able to offload some of this content onto the GPUs. Right? So the 4,000 to 6,000, sorry, 3,000 to 5,000 cores, they are obviously parallel processing this, this uh, my, my, my query. Let's go one more step. Let's search for, let's do some text search, right? So let's search for, I don't know, no secret. If anyone of you guys have been tweeting about it, could come here, right? No? 106 tweets. Not bad. But you see how fast it came, right? So you're able to now filter from 4, um, 4 billion to 4 billion, 69 million to less than, a little more than 100 tweets in a matter of a few milliseconds. Is the original data set sitting in persistence, or is it memory-based? Um, both. So the data set itself, um, let's see. Let's look at the data set. Right, so the data set is right here. So the data set is um, like any other database table. Right? So you have, you have columns, you have types, you have properties. So we support all the basic stuff, right? Uh, in, long, float, strings, timestamp, date, all of the good stuff. Um, there's a number of different ways you can store the data. So you obviously have primary keys, foreign keys, all of the good stuff that, you come, that comes with a traditional database. But you also have a concept of store only. So for example, the text field that comes with the tweet, you don't actually have to store it in, um, you don't actually have to store it in memory. You can just index it in memory, but store it on your disk. Right? So ways to optimize things. Right? And if you want to do a join, and you want data to co-locate within a single node, then you can shard it based on that key. Right? So you can, you can get fancy with things like this. Right? So let's. So I'm just going to click on one second. Sorry, I'm just going to click on some of these, right? So hopefully these are fit for work. So there you go. So it did. It did, it did uh, come up with this corresponding answer. Are you doing real time ingesting for data? Yes. Yeah. So we'll, we'll cover that. So here's another thing which I would like to do. Oh, oh sorry. Was I first? Oh, the picture to be a little bigger. Is Eric around? Eric is not around? Oh. oh, okay, never mind. Give me one second. So if Eric does come around, um, I don't know how to change it. Um, if Eric does come around, we'll ask him to increase the, the, there's the, the way this projector works is. OK. OK, I mean, I'm, really, I'm not going to stay on the screen for a long time. So. Okay, hopefully that helps. Sorry. Okay, so let's quickly do another analytics here, something that um, caught my fancy when I first found this out. So you have 4 billion tweets, right? So imagine you want to find nuggets of information in all of these tweets. 
right? So what I found is a person who who tweets with this handle RSC Henry, right? If I if I search for this person, you will find that he tweets based on geographical coordinates, right? So you can actually see that his tweets spell letters of the English alphabet. The letters mean nothing, but how would you know that you know things like this exit uh, exist in four billion four billion rows? Right? I, there are a few other examples like this, but this just gives you an idea of what are the things that you can do when you can get data instantaneously. Right. So I have a question. Sure. So you can search any any words, key phrases with tweets. Yes. Can you, can you try Bill O'Reilly? I don't want to. Some of it are not fit for work. So. <laughs> so just a funny story, right? Um, I used to follow Bill O'Reilly a lot before this happened, but um, I've I've varied my search a lot. During the election season, it used to be Hillary and Trump, and some of the tweets were not fit for work. During uh, the baseball season, it was Yankees. I came from, I come from Boston, so I, so you can do wildcard searches where you have two words next to each other within five characters of each other. So you can you know, search for Yankees and Red Sox within five words of each other. And some of these are <laughs> not fit for work. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. So are you working for a US government? <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Well, my, my, the founder was so, at one point of time. Okay, so let's quickly go and look at one more, um, one more uh, demo before we go back into uh, the architecture and then we'll cover about how ingestion works. Okay, so this is uh, the taxi information, right? So uh, not, not as much as Twitter. Twitter has four billion rows. This is around one billion, but still a lot of data. Right? So by now you can you know the power of the GPUs here, right? So you can actually slice and dice the data based on uh, various various dimensions. So the taxi data you can let's say let's say I want to find out all the taxis that originated with the vendor ID as VTS, right? I'm able to now let me. Okay, so hopefully you can. See. Okay, so now I was able to. Uh, filter down from 1.1 billion to little more than 513 million. Um, that's the vendor VTS. So let's look at all people who paid by cash. Right, so I further filter down to 282 million. Um, now, I want to find out all the taxis that originated from, let's say, Wall Street region, if I can draw the circle properly. You will now get the data very, very quickly. Right? Um, as part of deep learning and um, as part of deep learning, what people usually do is they take this data set, they would like to perform some analytics on the data set, but they have a concept of uh, training and inference, right? So you train, you try to train your models, you take your models and you apply a different data set and you try to train it again, and you ask questions and you repeat the process, right? You rinse and repeat. So one of the things that people are using uh, the product for is Let's say you're able to do you you were able to do like three or four filters and you ran it against against Wall Street, right? Now let's say you want to rerun this against a different region. So all you have to do is drag and drop against Upper East Side and find out all the taxis that started there. There you go. So you got the result immediately, right? So this is again on one billion rows. So the 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 result comes instantaneously and this allows you the possibility to rinse and repeat and run various uh, analytics very very quickly. Okay, so with that said, let me go back to my slides. So we'll see how all of this works. Do you have a, a, demo, a demo of some actual uh, machine learning? Um, <coughs> with, I'll come close. Okay. So I, we'll, we'll talk about that. So that'll, that'll be the last, hopefully, 10 minutes of the talk. Okay, so what is Kinetica, right? Okay, there you go. So at the end of the day, it's a GPU accelerated database, right? So we looked at a little bit of natural language processing. Um, we'll go into a little more uh, into what we what we can do with natural language, pro natural language processing. Uh, we have native GIS support, um, so essentially WKT, WMS. Um, I want to find the shortest distance between two geographical points. I want to find what's within a five mile radius, you know, things like that. Uh, we came from that background, so our CTO is heavily invested in geospatial. Um, we typically don't need any tuning, indexing, or, or tweaking. So for example, again I want to break from here and go back to that Twitter table. If you look at the, if you look at the table, you can see that there is 
nothing here in the index column. No indexes. Right? So when I when I hit the search, it was a brute force, a brute force search of the entire of the entire uh, uh, data. Right? Um, Sorry? Is it column score? Yes. Okay, so you can you have predictable scale out. Um, so the, the goal is you can scale up on one instance, on one Aminsky box. So for example, any Aminsky box can have anywhere from two GPU chips to eight GPU chips. So you can actually scale up within that box. But the best part is you can also scale out. Since I joined Kinetica, so I joined Kinetica six months ago, right? But I've been in this in memory space forever for around 16, 17 years before I joined Kinetica. Um, so one of the things that, so in the last six months, I've seen at least four or five other GPU databases come up. Um, so what the big difference between Kinetica and, and those databases, aside from the maturity of, of the different feature sets, is the way we've, uh, we are able to access data. So you obviously have your, your GPU chip, right, that Henry spoke about. So that has anywhere from 16 GB to 24 GB of, of memory. You have your system memory itself, and you have your disk. So some of these work only on system memory. Some of these work only on memory in your disk. Some of these work in a distributed way. So like MapD works on system on uh, GPU memory only. Uh, Scream works on um, that's another product which has a, uh, a GPU database that works on disk. There's um, Bright Lights. Bright Lights. That's I think the name of another one that came up. That also works on a subset of data. The good thing about us is we obviously scale up and scale out, but we also work on the various layers. Right? And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, there's a very, very deep integration with open source frameworks. So our, um, a lot of our, I would say around 40 to 50 percent, well, more than that, around 60 to 70 percent of our company came from a Hadoop background. So there's, my, excuse me, my manager came from um, Hortonworks. Um, our sales director is from uh, Cloud, Cloudera. And we have a number of folks from marketing and uh, partner management from MapR. So, there's a heavy, heavy investment in the open source uh, community. So we have connectors to Kafka, connectors to Spark, Storm. We're working with a few financial institutions that who want to offload um, Spark. They want to uh, look at uh, replacement for HBase or Ignite. Um, we're working with KDB streams, right? So like we're working with streaming data. So at the end of the day, um, because of because we have all of these uh, inbuilt features, it makes these integrations possible. So there are three main use cases for us, right? So the fast data, we just we just uh, I just showed you that, right? Fast OLAP, you can do your queries really really quickly. That's what we were purpose built for, right? The queries themselves would be offloaded to the GPUs, which enable uh, the speed. Uh, the native geospatial pipeline, right? So that makes it easier for uh, to work with large geospatial data, uh, especially for ideal for uh, IoT based use cases. And then finally, and this was again part of the trivia question, right? the convergence of AI and BI. So we have a concept uh, called user-defined functions. So you can, um, you can register a function, and this could be any function, a C++, um, Java, a machine learning library, a deep learning library, um, let's say a Monte Carlo algorithm, a gradient tree uh, algorithm, a simple linear regression algorithm. Right? You can register that as a function in a computer grid concept and run your function where your code exists, right? So we'll get a little, we'll get a little bit more deep on that, and I'll also give you a, a quick demo. Okay, architecture overview. So the way the data is, it's a, at the end of the day a columnar in-memory database. Uh, the data is persisted on disk, uh, so it's durable. Um, it's like a traditional RDBMS, so you can run queries. You have rows and columns. Um, you have let's let's quickly look at some queries here, right? So it's like a traditional RB, RDBMS. So if I go back to my UI, um, I have what is called as a SQL lab here. So what I'm able to do is use an ODBC driver to run some SQL queries on the data. Was I connected? Does the SQL already know what you pre-selected? No. Oh yes. Okay. Well, that, there you go. Okay. So I typed in the SQL prior because I don't want to type it right now. It would take ages for me to type it. But let's increase the font a little bit first. 
Okay. More? Oh, you can't see anything? Okay. Zoom in. Oh my gosh. Okay. Zoom out. Okay, there we go. Okay, so here's... <laughs> let, I'll, I'll try and explain what we're trying to do here. Or maybe, or maybe you can come to my seat here. Maybe that'll help. Uh, SQL 92 compliant. So what I what I wanted to do show you here was um, some of the um, some of the functions that we support. So uh, the reason why I'm showing you this, I mean, maybe it's too technical for you. Um, I'm a, I'm a geek behind the scenes, right? So obviously I, I think the one before was bigger. Was okay. not, was below. Oh, the font you mean? Yeah, it was better actually. You're like closer. Okay, there you go. No, no, no. no? Oh, the other one. The big one. Oh, the big one. Okay. One more. Sorry. This one? The problem is. Okay, there we go. Okay. The problem. Okay, never mind. Okay, so what the the reason why I wanted to show you this was I wanted to run certain aggregate calculations, right, on a table with four billion rows. So I wanted to run count, sum, average, min, max. So all of these require a complete table scan. So imagine doing a complete table scan on a table which has no indexes, right? Um, we also support uh, variance. We support you know functions like kurtosis, k-means. Um, so let's let's run this query, right? Let's run this query. Let's also run a between class, right? And see how long it takes. Okay. So that time obviously is obviously is wrong. So let's run it one more time. So that that's the problem with the UI. But there you go. It finished in 87 milliseconds. Right? And obviously, if I go down, so this has four billion rows, and I ran an aggregate query on it. Four billion plus, four billion and change, four billion, sixty-three million or something. Right? Eighty-seven milliseconds. Right? Um, and just to show you, okay, I'm going to go, okay, there you go. I'm going to show you a joint query. So this is on another table that has. So it's a, it's a movie table which has ratings for movies. So we were able to find this data. And all of this data set is publicly available, right? So I can show you anything on this. So this is uh, movies and ratings. So this is not as much. There's around 20 million rows. It's not billions, but it's still not 20 rows, right? So essentially, I would like to do a, a join on this table and do a like clause. Like, uh, like clause and distinct are usually very, very expensive, right? So let's try to do this on a table which is around 20 million rows. 24 milliseconds. So just so you know, this is um, without NVLink. With NVLink, you have to divide by five. So I'll let you do the math. What if you did an outer join? Do it you can do an outer join as well. I'm not going to do it now, but so you take can do out the, join. Take out the first part of the web and see what happens. I'm, I'm not going to do it now, but you can do an outer join. So let me, I, I, will, I, will, tell you, I will show you this. So we can try the. One second, sorry. So um, if you look at our, so this is our, this is our public, um, this is our public website. So if you go to um, configuration reference, sorry, connectors, and ODBC, under JDBC, ODBC connector, we have supported SQL. So this actually supports electron joiners. But um, I don't want to get into a syntax right now, so. I just have to take out that one of the where. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll, we'll do it after this. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there you go. So that's supported there. There you go. Those are the operations. Okay. Okay, um, the architecture, like I told you, we are support multiple layers. So this shows a distributed architecture. So you have your HTTP head nodes, um, which, are, which help with the ingest. So we are multi-threaded, multi-headed. So one of our, for one of our larger retailers, we were able to ingest. So we, we competed against um, another vendor who, were, who was able to do one billion ingests in one hour. Right? So it was uh, information, it was fleet management information, one billion rows in an hour, right? This is not bad, right? But we obviously wanted to beat that. So we had a 10 node cluster, which does multi-headed, multi-threaded. So each of your node can do an ingest, but it can do it in a multi-threaded multi way. So we were able to get one point, on an average, we were able to get 1.4 billion rows ingested per minute. 
and it peaked at 4 billion per minute. Right? So that's the power of, of parallel computing. So the each row was around 70 attributes long. I don't know the size of each row, but that's just to give you an idea of how fast print has been. Um, So I've primarily, so I'm based on Boston, right? So I primarily work with uh, financial services customers, some retail customers. I support Canada, um, so a few companies in Toronto. But um, I, I, can, I can probably get back to you. Maybe our CTO will, will would have would, would know a little better. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So um, one of the things that I really really like about the product is you, it abstracts. CUDA for you, right? So you, if you if you are a CUDA programmer and you know how to write uh, a Monte Carlo algorithm within within CUDA, that's perfect. You can still do it, right? So we obviously support native CUDA, but I came I came from a Java background. Um, I obviously know C plus plus, C, Python. Um, but if I know these languages, then you have API for all of these different languages, right? So you can code in Java, JavaScript, REST, C plus plus, Node.js, uh, Python. So all of these, again, let me break and go back here. API reference. OK, there you go. Right. So you have, you have these API. So if you click on any of these, it will actually give you a comprehensive API that we, that we support. Right. And like I told you, because of our uh, background with open source, we support, uh, we have a Kafka connector, Spark and Storm connector, we have an iFi connector. Uh, no. How much is it to have this solution? How much is the solution? How much to, to have the kinetical database? For you, for one license. <laughs> <laughs> for one license? I don't know. I don't know what. I I I I don't know. I mean, I'm 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 the, I'm the as you can see, I clearly see I'm a technical guy, so I don't talk money. So, um, but I can find you. <laughs> is the uh, Pulsex search is that GPU accelerated? Yes. Everything is. With or without indexes? Well, without indexes, but you can create indexes as well. I mean, in the, in the example that I showed you, I, so far I've not had the need to create indexes. But if you do create indexes, you'll, you'll have that much better. Can we get some examples of sub-second latency indexes and applications that are like that? I do. Yeah. So I have I've, uh, I've been I've been working on a lot of data that's indexed. But I've um, those are proprietary data, right? So I can't I can't show you the data. No, but use cases. So give me just an example of use cases that you're seeing in the customer. Oh, plenty. Um, so let's say there's um, there's uh, so we're working with a retail company that has um, products, SKUs, product history, and SKU history. So essentially, you want to search for certain product ranges. So they are actually using uh, a vendor that gives them results in. Uh, for for a search that requires a join between product which has around one billion rows, product history which has twenty billion, and SKU history is the biggest table that has twenty five billion rows. So their uh, existing query which joins between these takes uh, two minutes, right, to bring to bring back the data from a from a join of these two tables. So we were able to do it in three seconds, and the and we, we put. Dictionary encoding and with indexes, we were able to get it in three seconds. But without the indexes, we were able to get it in seven seconds. So that's, so that's awesome. What was the use case for Massey? So the use, yeah. So the use case was they wanted they they basically had to um, um, they they had their website which does certain historical analysis of uh, products and SKU, uh, products sold within the last year and compare it with their current inventory, and that's currently being done in a batch mode. And so they actually wanted a real-time way to do it. They wanted a dashboard that people can interact with and put in various, um, you know, timelines. Do do one of things. Again, it's a, a simple use case. Uh, they um, they didn't need they didn't need indexes. And they could have done it. They could have by seven seconds is so much better than two minutes, right? So clicking on a button and waiting for two minutes for the data to come back. But um, we created certain indexes for them, and that worked. 
But that was just one example, right? I mean, we are, we are into fleet management, we are into a lot of financial services, auto management, offloading KDB. We'll talk a little bit about um, certain um, uh, stock tick use cases and a little bit about XP analytics as well. Okay, so this is a streaming architecture. So one of the things that we've often seen is a Lambda-based architecture where you have you know, st Spark or Storm, uh, you could have a TIPCO, um, a CEP engine, a streaming engine, but essentially you have all your different data sets that are streaming in data. Um, it could be KDB as well, KDB feeds that are streaming in data. Um, you obviously have, I call this an actor, right? So you have an actor that processes the data and that ingests into, um, that ingests into Kinetica. What we've seen is, um, usually if you're using uh, Spark, it works very, very well, um, as long as you don't have to do uh, table scans. Uh, the moment you, um, you know, get a little bit complex, then Spark, um, it, it kind of struggles with, with uh, low latency. What we've also seen is the total cost of ownership um, when you use Spark, right? So you usually, uh, people usually use HSpace as a cache. They use a persistence layer. Uh, they use something for high availability. They use another layer like Ignite for, um, for real-time calculations. They use, sometimes they use HSpace for replay. So essentially the total cost of ownership when you're using a Spark um, um, when you're using a Spark as your as your framework as your CEP framework gets a little bit um, gets a little bit on the high end. So Kinetica obviously because we have you know Java connectors we have we have Python connectors we have various interfaces it's it's a it's, it helps with the simplicity of, of your architecture itself. Okay, um, let's quickly talk about. Um, how am I doing on time? Seven forty-eight. So let's. Uh, I have a quick, quick question. See yeah, TensorFlow. I'll go for ten more minutes and then. We'll uh, do you have any benchmarks for TensorFlow? Or? We support TensorFlow. I don't have benchmarks for TensorFlow okay. yet. But that's a good. Okay, time to do like a word to back kind of training or. Um, so we um, so what we've so let me let's let's uh, I'll talk about it in in one in one minute. Okay. So. Um, What's the convergence of AI and VR? So there were three big topics that Kinetica were Kinetica was very very good at, right? So the AI and VI uh, is the third one. The first one was fast OLAP. Second was geospatial. The, the AI and VI combination. What this is is uh, Kinetica allows you to take any piece of code, right? So if you have a linear regression code with with two dimensions, right? You could actually take that code, package it as a library. It could be a C++, it could be Java, it could be Python, it could be .NET, it could be JavaScript, it could be a machine learning library, uh, a Monte Carlo algorithm. You can package it as what we call as a user-defined function, excuse me, and deploy it within Kinetica, and you can, you can have multiple libraries deployed in Kinetica, like an app store, right, as a library store, right, and you can call your libraries with the feature set, with your data set of your choice. Right. So you can have your UIs, your various API, call your library in a compute to grid concept. Right. So you take your compute to where your data resides, as opposed to the other way around. So just to demonstrate this, let's go back to my my Google Chrome. Close these and go to. So I'm going to show you two demos very quickly. Okay, so I'm going to go to the stocks video. Okay, so what this does is it actually has stock tick information that uh, around 1.5 million rows. So you've seen how, um, okay, I'm going to reduce the, the view a little bit because I need to click on a few buttons and you can't see the data on one screen. Okay, so bear with me for a second, okay? So what I'm going to do here is choose information technology, right, choose, um, let's say technology, hardware, and peripherals, right? So you um, you are now able to boil down to twelve thousand rows out of one one point four million. Okay. Now what I have done is I have registered a procedure called a UDF called risk management. So what this what this does is it calculates value at risk and volatility for any stocks that are part of a data set, right? So these calculations, I have no idea what's behind, right? So these are black boxes to me. It could be, it, I got it from a partner, 
who was a data scientist. Right? What I did is I got his code. Right? He actually used C++. He could have used CUDA. He could have used any language of his choice. So I got it from him, and I registered it as part of my framework. Right? So I registered it right there. Right? I could have executed it right here as well. So if you have, if you have your function, all you have to do is register it here as part of another function. And now you can pick and choose what you want. So the UI, the UI portion of this is right here, right? So the risk management piece is now available, ready for you to use on your feature set. So the feature set that we just chose was a combination of these filters, right? So when I hit run procedure, it's now going to run on this feature set, and it's going to calculate the risk and volatility of this, of this results, right? So you can see that for this symbol HPQ, um, the volatility, well, I can now increase the font now. OK, that's interesting. It went away. That's a bug, but I'll run it again. So for that stock, you can see that the volatility is 2.3. So for every $100 that you invest, maybe Apple's a better, better example. For every hundred dollars you invest in Apple, there's a chance that your investment data goes down or up by 4.2 percent, right? And you also calculate the value at risk and what and uh, for 90, 95, or 99 percent confidence level. User defined function though is applied across the results post GPU processing, was it not? No. So the concept of UDX is um, the concept of UDX is a function that's registered within Kinetica. So you call that function as part of your as part of your procedure call. The procedure call is if you hand me a binary, you don't have a magic formula to take a Monte Carlo that's inside of a library and turn it into a piece of CUDA kernel code. So my question is, if I have a billion rows and I do the equivalent of a selection through the, D, the GPU in Connecticut, the output set vector is, let's say, a thousand rows, let's just say arbitrarily. Attached to that is some function, um, you know, min-max function, whatever, it's, it's irrelevant. That iter the iteration of that function runs on the host processors, not on the GPU, because that code doesn't magically become CUDA code, right? Yes, for now. OK, so let's, let's talk about it. So there's, there's two different flavors to this, right? The first, flavor to, the first flavor, what I'm talking about right now, is when you give me a CUDA code, sorry, when you give me any arbitrary black box, we would execute it as a separate kernel we would spawn up a new kernel and we would execute it um, within within the GPUs, right? Step two is we are working with another partner who would convert your code into CUDA. So that's the first thing that we spoke about, right? So we would take your code, we would CUDAize it, and we would run it again within the GPUs. The third piece, which is existing today, is if you have existing CUDA code, those obviously can be deployed. That's evident. That's yeah, obvious. So that's there. But the notion of turning an arbitrary library into arbitrary that's, PTX is not. I know it's not simple, but that's what okay. we're working on. Okay. So that's 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 in the roadmap, right? So. Okay. So um, just want to show you that, and then um, one quick one quick demo before we go back to the slides. So this is again something that we are currently working on, just to give you a flavor of where we are with with financial um, use cases. So this is. Again, I need to go back here for a second. I'll come back. OK. OK. So this is um, XVA. Uh, this is an example of XVA risk processing. So we, we, have, uh, we have a customer who wants to calculate um, XVA risk processing across a global hierarchy. Right? So essentially wants to calculate roll-up hierarchy, sorry, roll-up risk across Across various um, um, across various parties within his uh, within his financial tree. So what we were able to do is um, see all these dashboards are financial are financial calculations that would reflect um, the reflect what what entity you choose here. So let's see if I can drill down here. So let's say I drill down into the region Europe and drill down into specific banks here. I can actually choose a bank. And all my dashboards would change based on based on that choice, right? So essentially, you would have your XVA risk analytics performed across across that 
um, across that band that's chosen, and we also do a roll up across across to a higher level. So if I choose UK, now it's now going to perform the same calculation across all the bands that are present as part of that geographical <coughs> region. In addition, what uh, we wanted to do was to project the risk across future, right, across the next 10 years. So we are again able to project uh, do that. So this is the dashboard is just an implementation, a, a very small set implementation, but this is just to show you where our head is at, right, with respect to financial transactions and financial issues. Okay. Okay. So with that said, um, I want to talk about a couple of quick slides. Uh, it's going to be eight o'clock, so I want to uh, be aware of the time. Um, so the reveal is Kinetica uh, reveal is a dashboard that we provide that um, you can help uh, create widgets, right? So if you want to create a heat map, uh, a bar chart, a pie chart, all the things that I just showed you you can actually use the review framework to do that. So it's, again, comes, it comes embedded within the product itself. And then finally, um, what I would like to quickly show you is um, two more slides, and then I'll stop. OK. So this is the um, VRAM boost mode. So um, I told you about you know the various hierarchies in which we can store the data. This this slide talks about a little more about how how this works, right? So we have a concept where you can pin your data into your VRAM itself. So for super super fast data, so you obviously have anywhere from 16 GB to 24 GB on one chip. If you can have eight chips, but still it's not it's not terabytes, right? It's still it's still in in high uh, hundreds of gigabytes. So you can actually pin your data in VRAM. So we call it the VRAM boost mode. What you could also do is um, overflow to the next level, which is a system memory, and that could be that could be terabytes. So we are actually going to talk about a little bit about the power rate configuration and how the data resides there. Um, we can also have data on your SSDs, on your SAN. So essentially, it's a layer for overflow. Right. So there's a lot of things that you can do to optimize the data, store only tab, store, uh, a store only concept. Um, you can index your data in memory, but store it on disk, shard your data uh, depending on where um, what queries queries run. But you can get fancy with all of those. Does anyone use your product for high speed cache, high performance cache, caching engine? Cache as in CACH? Yeah, caching engine. So, um, no. So, I came from a caching background. Um, and the, the mantra is if you talk cache, there is no cache, CASH. Right? So, if you talk CACHE, there is no CASH. So, people try to stay away from the word so cache. So, that's. Cache. So we we are not we are not a caching framework. We are not a we are not, we are we are a, we are a database, right? So at, at the end of the day, it's an in-memory database. Um, people use us for you know get getting data closer to your application, but it's this mode, right? So it's going back. It's not it's not it doesn't reside within. So a cache usually resides within your application itself. So this is more of a, of a, of a I would say L2 storage, right? It's not L1 storage. It's not level one, right? You actually have to go and access the data using some sort of an API. So, sorry, sorry. Your indication that if you use cache, then you have no cache. Is that what you're saying? Is because you don't want? No, no, no. That's no one's going to pay that. No, I don't want to confuse you. So that's a marketing thing. So forget I said that, right? So it's <laughs> it's, it's something. I was trying to be funny, but obviously that didn't resonate. <laughs> <laughs> Oh no no, it can be. I the I I, I was it in full disclosure um, before I joined Kinetica, I spent six years with a company that was specifically caching, and and my my wife has her shoes because of that, right? So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not, nothing against caching. So. Uh, full text search. So we didn't do this today. Right? But you could do things like this, right? So I want to find out words like rain and tide within five words of each other. Um, you can do those queries as well. Um, you can do um, you can do wildcards. I think we demonstrated a wildcard. You can do grouping. You could do fuzzy search. I still don't know what this algorithm is, but apparently we support it, right? So that's good. Okay, demos. We already finished the demos. So a quick point about the NV link that Hillary spoke about. So um, what 
we've seen what, so what what let me put it this way. So the architecture here, I know she spoke a little bit about it, but the architecture here talks about um, a 16 GB maximum for the PCIe slot and a 40 GB for the NVLink, right? That's true. So it's two and a half times faster, right? Approximately. What I've personally seen is 10 times faster. Right? So when I run my queries in, in, uh, using, using the NVLink with the P100s and I compare it with the KAEs, I've not, I've not compared it with P100s without the NVLink. I've compared it with the KAEs with PCIe. I've seen a 10x performance improvements. So you mentioned Spark earlier. So Spark and Kafka integrate with IBM Bluenet. Yes. Can you talk a little bit about how Well, of the Spark and Kafka integration? So we'll have, we'll, have to, we'll have to break it down a little bit and, and look at the exact architecture. But at the end of the day, yes, we would enhance, we would enhance the latency. We would streamline the hardware itself. So essentially what we've seen, rather what I've seen is um, when, we, when we have a customer who uses Kafka, Storm, Spark, um, and Hadoop background, so usually uh, using Kinetica reduces the overall hardware simply because GPU has 5,000 cores. Right? So it simplifies the architecture, but because of the horsepower that GPU provides, you will be able to get results faster, you'll be able to more stream, get, get, get more accurate results much faster. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. You're comparing against uh, PCIe single channel, but NVIDIA, you know, it supports bridging two cards, right? It does. So right. how does that compare with? NVLink is so much better. Looking from the, uh, like I told you, right? I've, I've done, I mean, I, I'm a geek, right? So I actually do this. After this, after this talk, I'm actually going to go and work on on uh, NVLink. Right? I'm actually going to be doing a POC. And from the application side, I personally have seen ten times improvements. Even if you have multiple PCIe cards, even if they are bonded, whatever it is, I've seen NVLink beat the performance handily. Right? And I know that uh, Nvidia is coming out. So usually they they come out with new technology uh, in their. Um, I think in, in May they have a event in. Uh, in San Francisco. So, the, well, I'm hoping they might be coming out with NVLink too, I don't know. So again, don't quote me, but hopefully they come out with something that, that excites, that takes this to the next level. Um, then finally, this is my last slide. So what I would like to um, talk about is a little bit about the recommended hardware. So what we've seen is, um, from our side, the best performance for us GPU and CPU is for every 256 GB of RAM we like to associate one GPU and one CPU socket, right? So that's the ratio we go with. Um, sometimes for a terabyte, so for one, for these Minsky boxes, I think you have a terabyte of RAM, but you could potentially have a two P100s, right? But um, what I've personally seen is the ratio that we just spoke about, right? Two fifty-six GB to one socket to one GPU. That works very, very well. Okay, so that's all I had. So I know there are questions here, but any other questions? If there's any questions, we can read them. Please go ahead. Um, when you were making the comparisons, the performance comparisons, do you do you have to redesign the data when you do the second tier test on, on your hardware? Um, so what we usually do is uh, we, these are queries, right? So at the end of the day, you have to configure, you have to obviously load up the data, which is very, very fast. We have a number of ingests uh, that do it. But when you're running queries, you simply point to the, the, your, uh, uh, your ODBC data source to, you just choose, choose the data source of the drop drop when you're running your test, right? Choose, choose your database, choose us, right? And you just run the queries, right? But you don't have to recode anything. You don't have to recode, thank you. Yes, you don't have to recode anything. That's the best part, right? Um, the queries might be a little bit, just one quick point there. The queries might be a little bit different in terms of syntax. For example, the date function could be, you know, I've seen date functions in Google BigQuery that start with STML underscore DATE, right? So obviously our date function would be DATE or something different, right? So you'll have to keep those things in mind, but those are small ones. So it runs on power or it runs on x86 as well? It runs on x86 as well, but obviously you've spoken about the appendix. Hardware-based question. Um, <coughs> compared to the NVLink, what do you think about the Intel's upcoming the Octane 3DX Quant or the Micron Quant X10? Uh, how would you compare the uh, 
the bandwidth or the in-house processing because they're supposed to be like super fast as well. I am not in trouble with that. Yeah, so the question I think was about Intel Optane 3D Crosspoint and VME drives, is that right? Yes. Yeah, so the GPU is dealing with the calculations that you're doing. Uh, the Optane drives would be dealing with the latency to get to a larger out of memory pool of data. Um, so it, it, it has to do with a different component of the system performance. If you had a database that was sitting in storage, um, putting Optane drives into that system, would enable you lower latency to access that. But the GPU is a secondary performance benefit in that it's doing the computations, the analytic on that data once you have it pulled in much more quickly than, than if you had a system that was only running analytics using a CPU. Next question. Yes. Oh, um, the analytic functions uh, for your SQL, are they programmed uh, to uh, to get results hierarchically. You mean order? Pardon me. Order order by? You mean? Yeah. For, you so mean for example, if you want to calculate the average of a table, do you calculate an average for a portion? Oh, what do we do behind the scenes? Yeah. Okay. So I, I'm not sure if you're at liberty to discuss that. No, but no, I can do it. Fun. But how much time do you have, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so behind, well, I'll make a chart, right? So at the end of the day, what we do is we have a concept called chunk all of those boxes that we have, so we've divided it into chunks. So the, the, the algorithms themselves will run on those chunks, right? And what they have is something called TOM. TOM is type object manager. So each chunk will have a type object manager. So at the end of the day, what we do behind the scenes is similar to MapReduce, right? So we essentially run it on the various TOMs, and there's a head node which collects the data. But even when you run it on the TOMs, at the end of the day, they go back to P100s, right? So that's one of the reasons why, why, why we do it faster. Same with ingest, right? But obviously when you're ingesting with multi-headed, multi-threaded, you have to take, take into account any ordering that you have to do, right? So if you have two tables that need to go one after another, front key references do it one after another. Yes, in the back. Uh, does it use the proprietary data that you Well, I've shown you the data, right? So it's, we support ins, longs, loads, any, any ordinary data set. So it's not, um, it could be structured, it could be unstructured. We support JSON as well. We support Avro schema. That's what we use behind the scenes as well. Um, behind the scenes, the indexes are leucine and solar indexes. You, you, yeah, yes, you can. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. Um, there's little more to the answer, but the short answer is yes, you can. If you have a system that has CPUs and GPUs on premise, it's behind your firewall. You can use Kinetica there, and the data remains yours. It remains proprietary. There's no need to upload it to a cloud or give it to anyone involved in the process. Yes. How is performance when you have multiple queries running in the system? For example, Spark, we recommend uh, to run That's two tables. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like you're using Spark. <laughs> Yeah, we've found There you go. So uh, we've, we've had that question before. So uh, we are not asset compliant. So what it essentially means, the reads don't lock on each other. There's no locks. There's no transactions. So as long as you're reading from the same table, we get we, we serve the data with eventual consistency. Right? So if there's another thread that's we're writing into the data, then that would that would complete, but the reads won't block. Right? So you can have any number of concurrent reads um, from from that data set. But uh, how does that work if the rows are being updated? Eventual consistency, dirty leads. Dirty leads, yes. Before we take the, the next question, uh, has everyone had a chance to put their card or fill out the form? No, you're holding on. Okay. Um, if you could just pass this back. Someone is going to win in the next five minutes um, these beautiful VR, VR, uh, VR goggles. And uh, everyone's got to have the, their paper in there or their business card. So. Anyone? Yeah. Can you send it back? There's one more person. All the way in the back. All right, uh, Jack, we'll take that question.
Is that a question or is that a card that I can't see this like oh never mind. Who's got the next question? You okay. So a lot of the technical diagrams in terms of hardware architecture look like they're very geared towards NVIDIA, which of course typically has a cascade of video memory behind what they refer to as host memory. However, other organizations such as AMD or other folks talking about what might happen in the future talk about a memory architecture where the GPU and the CPU are sitting on the same bus. So then you don't have a memory transfer issue. Um, that may not be ultimately an NVIDIA strategy. Is Kinetica receptive or is IBM receptive to future non-NVIDIA GPU-based architectures? Or are you guys pretty partnered with NVIDIA and that's kind of where you're going? So from, from an IBM perspective, I'll comment that in addition to the Open Power Consortium that we showed the 300 members for, um, there's a new open standard referred to as Open Cathy, which is intended to be a very high bandwidth um, open standard for attachment of accelerators, new memory technologies, other things like that. Um, so from an IBM perspective, we definitely want to see um, a variety of accelerators attached on an, um, an open industry standard type interface. Uh, just related to that, are there other uh, like you know companies that are trying to use this Minsky and GPU setup just like Sanofi? Absolutely, yeah. There are a lot of companies. There's also a lot of open source software. So um, we have a suite of tools called Power AI. Um, Power AI is a, a distribution of binaries so that you don't have to deal with the you know 97 package and library dependencies and such of all these um, uh, machine learning and deep learning toolkits. Um, that includes all of the major open source frameworks, TensorFlow, Cafe, Piano, uh, Torch, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that's all explicitly GPU accelerated on the Minsky server. We have time for just one more question. Hands? I got lights, I can't see it. Just someone shout out a question. No question? Okay. So let's start with a great big round of applause to our two speakers, Julian and Parker. We now going to raffle off this VR headset. Um, can I ask you to stick your hand and mix it all up? Thank you. No way. Okay. Can I ask you to reach in and pull out a random one without looking? I read it out. I want to say the name. Um, Ikanaga Mahendra. Ikanaga Mahendra. Yeah. Is that you? <laughs> All right. Both Hillary and Karthik are here for one-on-one -on -one questions. Feel free to come up and ask them right now. Thank you all for coming. Thank you.